Hello family, it's African Esquire and I want to say happy Liberation Day to all of my people throughout the African diaspora. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to really participate fully inside of the day because of my crazy schedule this week and then also because of just coming back from Africa. But I do want to do a video in commemoration of a leader who I think really stands for African liberation in so many ways, and particularly because I think that he represents so many stages of the African diaspora, and that is Stokely Carmichael. Many of you, if you watch my videos, you probably hear me quote Stokely Carmichael um, very often because he's very his philosophy is very influential um, to my philosophy, especially coming into um, understanding Pan-Africanism and revolution as being the only alternative for true freedom for African people. Now, the th reason I say that Stokely is kind of the embodiment of the African diaspora is because of the stages he went through in his life. He started off um, in Trinidad, that's where he was born. However, his family um, immigrated to New York City when he was a child, and so he becomes part of the African American experience. From there, actually, he ends up going to Africa, and he actually died in Africa. Now, during these different phases, Stokely had so many powerful moments, so much, much monumental moments in his history, and it's so crazy that we don't really talk about him or acknowledge him, because to me, we should be talking about Stokely right up there when we talk about Huey P. Newton, or when we talk about Malcolm Martin, because he really was that influential. So I'll give you two examples of ways that he was was unbelievably influential. Um, as many of you know that back in the 60s and the 70s, a big controversial issue, I guess the Me Too of that day, was the Vietnam War. Everyone was talking about the Vietnam War. The country was going haywire. People were um, protesting. People were doing blowing up buildings as a form of de a demonstration against the United States government. There was worldwide outrage if, because, if you don't know, the acts that the United States Army was committing in Vietnam was basically genocide against those people. And the ultimate contradiction was to ask, to ask the people who the United States have oppressed, you know, since the beginning of this country's founding, to go fight inside of this war on behalf of the imperialist structure that essentially uh, oppressed us to begin with. So the United States looked at us, African people in America, and said, yeah, we know we've been enslaving you, and we've been killing you, and we've been oppressing you. However, go over there to Vietnam and fight this fight for us. And a lot of African people said, no, heck no. Why would, why would we go kill ourselves to go fight something that is basically completely against our moral compass. So Stokely was one of the ones that came up with the famous phrase. And the famous phrase is, hell no, we won't go. You, you might have heard white people saying this phrase because it's so, it became so mainstream. But he was the one that coined that phrase. And then, of course, it went crazy haywire throughout the United States. The other um, phrase that Stokely coined, which is um, very powerful, is the phrase Black Power. If you've read, uh, Stokely Carmichael has a book called Black Power, where he breaks down that there is a difference between institutional racism and individual racism. And what he says is that Black people, what we need is Black Power. We need the ability to determine our own destinies. So he was the one that started that um, phrase. Whenever we say black power, we took an, we're taking a phrase that was invented by Stokely Carmichael. Now, outside of these phrases, just these phase, um, phrases, Stokely also had a number of um, times where he was involved inside of the liberation movement. Really, throughout going, to, he went to Howard University, throughout going to Howard, and really until the day that he died. But the most, um, most notable ones that we probably know very well is that Stokely was a member of SNCC, the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee, and there he um, was very instrumental in organizing voter registration drives inside of the South, the segregation itself, to where he's getting chased by the Ku Klux Klan and everything, trying to get people to organize inside of these majority black towns that where people are so scared to vote because of the white presence that are, or white terrorist presence that was threatening their right to vote. Um, in addition, he was also a part of the Black Panther Party after because he was eventually ousted from SNCC and he became a part of the Black Panther Party. And um, after leaving the Black Panther Party, he also was very um, 
very instrumental inside of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. The party that was started by Kwame Nkrumah, and this party still exists today. There are still many people organizing in this party and doing great things in this party today. And Stokely was an organizer in this party and was a staunch advocate of this party really until his death. Um, other notable things, whenever Stokely went to Africa, he, um, he went to Africa where he stayed with uh, he stayed with, I know he met with um, Nkrumah a number of times, but he ended up staying with Sekou Toure, and he lived in Guinea. Actually, he was in Guinea during the coups when um, Sekou Toure was ousted as the leader of Guinea. So um, that was really his home. That's where he, re where he really did a lot of his activism, and we'll probably really never know what Stokely did in Guinea or what he did throughout Africa because he wasn't the one to broadcast everything. But I'm sure people are living today who are influenced by this man. And I will just make a recommendation. Um, really powerful book. Really, really powerful book. He has a book called Stokely Speaks. I wish I had it in my hand. It's actually, I don't know where I put it. But it's a very great book. Um, you know, the way that this guy's mind works. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of intellectual, like, food and to me like the same way that I can ingest other I can ingest like Amos Wilson and be like wow the way that this guy's mind works and puts these things into um puts these concepts into words and just tells it beautifully he was like one of those types of people he breaks down imperialism colonialism so many of the issues in a black African diaspora so perfectly so I will say I very much recommend you, could, you should read his book. He has so many speeches online. And in commemoration of African Liberation Day and this African leader who I think really embodied the spirit of African Liberation Day, um, I'm going to just do a compilation video just to show, just to give people an idea of Stokely Carmichael so that we just understand that this was someone who was very important to our liberation and who really lived through so many phases of the African diaspora. Again, started off in Trinidad, came to the United States, and then goes to Africa and really tours the world um, calling for pan-Africanism and calling for black power. So that's all I have and I'm going to let you watch this video compilation of the problem has been as black people, we've always been concerned about white America, never about us. And what we've always thought is that white America equal the same interest as us. That is not true. We must now be concerned with us. Let me give you some examples. We always want to prove what good Americans we are. The very first man to die for the War of Independence in this country was a black man named Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks. He was a fool. Because here he was dying for white folk freedom and millions of his brothers were enslaved in the very country. Oh, but we wanted to prove what great Americans we were. We begged the white folk to let us fight in the War of Independence and they said no. So we organized ourselves in bands of armies, training ourselves with our bare foot to prove to the white folk what great Americans we were. Please let us fight, white folk. And finally they came and inspected our troops and said, good niggas, you can fight. And they had us fighting the Indians. Like fools, we should have teamed up with the Indians and take care of you know who. Now I want you to, before I begin, to take a look at all of the press men before you. You will notice that not one of them are black. the nerve tomorrow to call me a racist. Are you <laughs> but we understand how the honkies are. They don't recognize their own racism. I understand that I'm following the great white father, Bobby Kennedy. I understand last night he told you a couple of things. Now, I want to put some of them in perspective for you. When he said the world belongs to you, that comes from a great black man by the name of Frederick Douglass. He said the world belongs to you. Secondly, I understand that Bobby Earl 
encourage us to stand up and speak out against injustice. Well, we could tell him that we don't need anybody to tell us to stand up anymore. Not only are we going to stand up, we're going to right the wrongs of our people in this generation. Our generation has the memories of the unpunished murders of Swirney, Goodney, and of Medgar Evers. There are going to be no more unpunished murders. They've been telling you that the kids in Nashville started a riot. Number one, you ought to recognize it is not a riot, it is a rebellion. A rebellion. And number two, you ought to be proud of your black brothers and sisters at Fifth because a hunky cop touched one of them and they told him you got to touch all of them. a fact, if you look at history, I have known no great man or no great woman that didn't belong to an organization, not one. The American capitalist system was so confused, some of us, that we will actually think that we by ourselves can lead the people to their freedom. There's no such thing as Rambo or Superman. It exists only in Hollywood. Fidel Castro, as bad as he is, he needs a communist party of Cuba to help direct Cuba. V.I. Lenin, as rough as he is, he needed a Bolshevik party. Karl Marx was a great man, had to organize the International Working Men's Association. The Honorable Marcus Garvey saw Claire and Long, but he needed the Universal Negro Improvement Association of the African Community Leagues. Patrice Lumumba was a great man, he needed organization. Harriet Tubman was a rough sister, she needed organization. Rosa Parks sat down so we can get up. She needed organization. Malcolm X so loved organization that when he left the Nation of Islam, he created two organizations, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated for Muslims and the African American Organization, spotted after the, uh, uh, Afri the Organization of African Unity. Everywhere you will see the need for organization. Martin Luther King was a righteous man, but even he recognized the need for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And while Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela is known all over the world, he still has the African National Congress. Every brother or sister who truly seeks to advance the world must belong to an organization. This we will not stop. Students on campus, what would you say to a possible population of apathetic African students who don't have time for their people or only have time to get their degree? How would you, per se, like Light a fire. All right, uh, in the first place, you must take away the word apathetic. There are no apathetic people. Their energies are misdirected. For example, if you call a meeting of African students on this campus and put up leaflets everywhere, not many of them will show up. But if you have a dance on Friday night and don't tell nobody, everybody will. <laughs> so uh, the energies are not apathetic, it's just the energies are misdirected. Uh, in every aspect now to follow your life, you have brothers and sisters on this campus, I'm sure, who, while being members of fraternities and sororities, are also Christians. And I'm willing to bet you they know more of the history of their fraternities and sororities than they do of Christianity. Yes, it's fact. You know, I mean, it just shows you. Uh, even today, uh, Christians in this country know more about the life of O.J. than they do of J.C. Peace be upon his name. <laughs> so you must understand that it is not the student that is apathetic. The student's energy is misdirected. Your job is to redirect the energies to the forces that affect their lives. So once you take this, you've made the fight an objective fight. <clears throat> that is, you understand the forces which you are up against. If you don't do that, you make serious trouble. One of the errors that people in our community make all the time is that they make an analysis of an oppressed people and they leave out the oppressor. You can never make an analysis of an oppressed people in any aspect of their life and leave out the oppressor. If you do, you'll end up blaming the people. And so once you blame the people, then you're in trouble because now you've got to recreate them. Or, you know, but once you understand that there are forces and I'm making them go this way, then you know your struggle is against these forces. All right. Now, that brings us to the solution. This question we're asked all the time, and the solution is really very simple. <laughs> you know, the truth is uh, very simple, but sometimes implementation of the truth, that's where difficulty arises. The word is constant. 
political education? Constitution. I mean, like they are. You know, whether you want to know something about the OJ trial or not, you don't know something about it in this country today. Whether you want to or not, now I don't care about it, really. You know, what you know about it? He ain't never did nothing for us. Why care about it? Well, he might go to you and he might lynch him. Well, they've lynched better Africans than that on justice. So. <laughs> you know, so really, that's not my problem. But you cannot get around it. Because they're constant. I guess constant. we could start with 1956 for our generation. This was the beginning of the rise of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King decided that in Montgomery, Alabama, black people had to pay the same prices on the buses as did white people, but we had to sit in the back. And we could only sit in the back if every available seat was taken by a white person. If a white person was standing, a black person could not sit. So Dr. King and his associates got together and said this, is inhuman. We will boycott your bus system. Now understand what a boycott is. A boycott is a passive act. It is the most passive political act that anyone can commit. A boycott. Because what the boycott was doing was simply saying we will not ride your buses. No sort of antagonism. It was not even verbally violent. It was peaceful. Dr. King's policy was that nonviolence would achieve the gains for black people in the United States. His major assumption was that if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and will be moved to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one fallacious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. The United States has none.